The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 696, a palindromic episode, for Monday, February 12th, 2018. Ah, Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab. The show where you are invited to send in your tips, your questions, your cool stuff found. We answer your questions. We share your tips. We share your cool stuff found all with the goal of each of us learning five new things every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include BB Edit from Barebone Software with BB Edit 12.1 that has a very exciting new feature. We'll talk about that a little bit later here here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Fearful, Connecticut, John Efron. <laughs> How are you doing today, John Efron? No, I'm just playing with the intonation there. Yeah, I like that. It's good. It's good. Excellent <laughs> diction, my friend. Yes. Diction. <laughs> diction. No, no, you were right. I think intonation is, is, is right for what you described. I was just, you know, adding to that. Excellent diction. As we always do. Uh, that's the goal. Each and every time we get together, isn't it? Uh, so I am very happy to be podcasting today because I slipped and fell. Actually, middle of the week last week, I was fine for a little while. And then I did a fateful stretch. I slipped on the ice and then did a fateful stretch on Friday. And really, it was too painful to even talk all weekend. So uh, so I am very happy to be here sitting on the heating pad podcasting. If this show was this, winds- uh, it, what was it? it, it was it? it uh, in your home or was it in an area where you could possibly uh, uh, bring action against someone? Or? No, it was in my driveway. It was right after it started oh. snowing on Wednesday. But, um, okay. but really, so you even after yourself, yeah, you could even, sue yourself for improper maintenance or uh, yeah, <laughs> but snow it, clearing. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it was while it had just as it had started snowing, but uh, we had some ice underneath it. So anyway, um, yeah, but I'm like happy to be doing this. It's really, it was the most pain I've ever been in in my life was dealing with this like muscle spasm that anytime I engaged my core, not good. So, uh, but obviously we're doing okay. I'm doing okay. You're doing okay, John. I'm doing great. Good. Then, uh, then let's go to, uh, let's just dive right in here and let's go to Tom who asks, uh, Tom says, uh, Oh, wait. This is wow. That's really small. I'm also on a different setup today, John. I I'm you know because why not? I should. I got it. This should just be to take over all kinds of things. He's uh, he says. Uh, I have an old mid 2006 17 inch iMac that has an internal drive that has failed to boot. Uh, he says I get the flashing folder icon. The drive is not making any noises, so I'm assuming it won't damage the drive further to try to restore it. I'm able to boot the iMac into target disk mode, but when I hook it up to my MacBook Pro, the disk does not mount. When I bring up disk utility on my MacBook Pro, it shows an external disk, but the size is 0K, and it still won't mount when I click the mount button. And he goes through how he tried Disk Warrior, and he tried all kinds of things. Nothing will uh, will fix this drive. Nothing will really even scan it. Um, disk Warrior gets the furthest, but... Uh, not really happy. Uh, and he said, uh, can I use data rescue five to restore some of the user's files off this disc? I haven't purchased it yet. And I'm wondering if I need the pro version to recover the files. I'm hoping I can get to the files without having to use a service like drive savers or total recall, which are too expensive for my clients. So this is a client's um, setup here. I, I mean, I think the drive's dead uh, based on everything you're saying here. You know, it, I I think it's dead. I mean, but, dude, we're talking a 2006. I mean, this is over a decade old. Yeah. So I'm I'm amazed that <laughs> it's actually still working. That's the thing. You know, with drives, it's, until now, it's not if, it's when, right? You know, at what point will it fail? Especially a mechanical drive, which this clearly is from a 2006 machine. Uh, it you know it it's a it's a moving p- piece of machinery it's got a motor in it it you know like it's going to stop at some point 
Uh, it is a maintenance free motor, so you can't like go in and add more oil or anything to make it happy. Um, at least not without taking it apart and risking damage to the platters, yeah. which is why drive savers and total recall exist. Right. Um, ProSoft also has their own uh, data recovery center, I believe it's called. But um, but I would I would start first with um, a demo of ProSoft's Data Rescue 5, because the worst thing that's going to happen is it'll tell you it can't read anything. And then, you know, uh, the demo version won't restore anything or much of anything. But that's sort of the point is you download the demo. It shows you what it can find. And then it says, all right, cool. If this is you know most likely going to work at some level for you. If you want to buy it, I think it's 99 bucks or something and you pony up, pony up and go. So uh, the demo in this case is really handy, I think. Uh, but uh, but your mileage may vary. But what do you uh, what do you think, John? I mean, looking at the So looking at the Disc Warrior report. Yep. Um, what comes up and that he tried to fix is something named inode 104535. OK, that's bad because. To me, that's the name of something that the user should never see. That's like an internal thing. So I think the the uh, my guess here is that the partition table or directory or something between the two got scrambled. And it's, well, you can get it back, though. I mean, the thing is, data rescue and things like that are pretty smart. So they, they tear through your drive. It can take a real long time. And they look for patterns like, oh, that's a GIF. Oh, that's a doc. Oh, that's a this or that. But um. What he tried to do here, and, and Drive Genius will do this too, and actually I've had this work sometimes, is that it can do various rebuilds. And by rebuilding a directory isn't a bad idea because it sounds like that got corrupted, but I think something more, like I said, probably the partition table did if you're seeing things called inode. That's yeah, not right. normal. Yep. <laughs> yep. I don't disagree. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know, I would, like I said, the demo of, of, um, uh, data rescue five is is what i would go with and see what happens or restore off of uh the latest backup that was made which i hope there was yeah well especially <laughs> with a drive that old you kind of have to have a backup going don't you i gotta say the, the thing about this question that got me dave is 2006 man. yeah yeah. That it's still running. It's pretty good. And that it's still working. Yeah. But I had that too. I, I had a drive in my Drobo die recently and it was about 10 years old. Um, so that's a, a pretty good run for a rotational drive. There you go. Like you said, uh, all things fail. All things fail. All right. Simon brings us to the next question. He says, I'm stuck. Uh, I ordered a Dymo 4XL printer. And am used to wireless air print printers. I'm looking for a free or cheap option to share this printer on my network. I have a Vodafone router with printer sharing and I have a Synology DS216+. Plus. I can't seem to find information on if this printer is compatible with these devices. Uh, he says, I know Dymo uh, sells a wireless network adapter, but it costs uh, almost 100 quid. So, uh he wants to avoid that if possible. Well, two of the things that you have, your Vodafone router and your Synology disk station will share printers over a network. Now, I've never used the Vodafone one, so I can't speak to how well that works. But the I've used the Synology printer sharing and it's great. And your DS216 Plus, thankfully, has USB ports on it. So you could plug this printer right into that. And then the, the disk station becomes your print server. It shares the printer on the network. It will even share it as like a Google print or an AirPlay. Air, sorry, not AirPlay. HomePod on the brain. We'll get there later. Uh, an AirPrint printer. And I like that. It works great. So I, that's the first thing I'd try because it's free and it's a known quantity. And we know that it works. The Vodafone would be the second thing I'd try because uh, it should work. And then after that, uh, you know, that's when. That's when maybe we got to start. I got one. some money. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if you happen to have a uh, Mac sitting around, <clears throat> I did this for the longest time, Dave, is that I had my um, HP B8550, which was a 13 by 19 inch inkjet printer. Okay. I had it plugged into my Mac mini. And then what you can do with a Mac mini or Mac OS 
is you can share a printer on the network. Oh, right. Of course. I mean, that worked fine for me. Um, that's all I got to say. The driver um, was probably the best driver. Um, and, you know, that's the thing with the, uh, you know, I tried, I actually did try sharing that printer, which is an older printer, because I like running old things, because sure. I don't know what's wrong with me. But I, I plugged it into the Synology, and actually, because it uses, I, I think you pointed out, it uses a, oh, what is it? Is it, it Guten Print, I think? Yes. Okay. That was in my head, but you confirmed it. So if we both think that, but the thing is it didn't have a driver that was quite right for that printer because it was an unusual printer. It had an unusual paper size. So, um, sharing it with the Synology didn't quite work for that model printer, but I'm sure for, for tons of others it does But sure. because the driver on the Mac was specific enough, um, sharing it via the Mac sharing, uh, Words. is a uh, something I'd try. Yeah. So, cool. Give that a whirl. It's not, it, it's not air print technically, but you know, I mean, you can access it as long as it's on the network. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. And there are things, is it printopia that will then take your Mac printers and share them as air print printers? Is that what it is? I know there's, yeah. Yeah. It's printopia. You install it on your Mac and then that will, uh, share your printers as an air print device if you want to print from your iOS devices. So we'll put that in the show notes too. Good. Yeah. All right. So we uh, cover the bases there. All right, cool. Uh, moving on to Bob, Bob asks, he said, would a wireless mesh system such as Eero provide better coverage and speed throughout my house than my existing wireless router? He says he's got a Uverse residential gateway, a Buffalo WZR 1750 DHP router. And uh, he says the Buffalo router is attached to the AT&T device in bridge mode. So the AT&T device is your router. Buffalo is doing your wireless. He says my Uverse internet account speed should be 24 megabits per second, but I rarely get this. I normally get about 10 to 12. Recently, it's been even lower. I've restarted both the residential gateway and the Buffalo router. But again, the speed is inconsistent. So, okay. Um, I want to sort of dissect this a little bit because th to answer the question, would, would a mesh system provide better coverage and speed? It depends, right? Mesh is great for increase, increasing your coverage area. No question about that. So if you're, uh, but if you're not having, coverage or range issues. Like if you're able to see a Wi-Fi signal, uh, especially a strong one or everywhere you need to, then you don't have a coverage problem. Speed issues can come from a number of things, right? It's certainly possible that if you have weak coverage and you're down at like, you know, one bar on your iPhone, uh, that you're at the edge of Wi-Fi range, you're going to get lower speeds than you will, you know, further in, further, further close. So doing some different tests from different places will give you an idea but it's also important to do an Ethernet connected test from a computer that's Etherneted directly into your router or, you know, something akin to that. If you've got, you know, switches running all over, that's fine. But just make sure it's, you know, Ethernet all the way from your computer to the router because you want to remove Wi-Fi from the equation here. We're talking about very slow speeds, right? I mean, 24 megabits a second really isn't that fast for today's Wi-Fi devices, 10 megabits is, and is, is, you know, even less fast. I don't think your problem is your Wi-Fi. I think your problem is your internet connection with AT&T. And doing an Ethernet test will confirm that. Uh, so that, you know, it, it's, it's easy to run a speed test app or, you know, go to speedtest.net or whatever on your Mac, but... That tests two things simultaneously. It tests whatever your local network connection is and then also tests your Internet connection. And whatever the weakest link in the chain is, is going to be the result that it shows. So if you have a weak Internet connection, it's going to show the speed from that. If you have a weak Wi-Fi connection, you know, then it would show that. But you have no idea without a baseline what it's showing you. That's why the Ethernet connected test is a good one to do. So at least you know what your Internet speeds are. I also recommend using something like iPerf and I'll put an article in the 
the show notes that Jim Tannis did for us a couple of years ago, explaining how to use iPerf to test your local network speeds without including the internet so that you can rule out that variable. That's, that's my feeling. Thoughts, Mr. Braun? And I think that's a good feeling. So the thing is, number one, I agree with you. Setting a baseline when, when Bob said my U-verse internet account speed should be 24. So yeah, that should be the speed you're getting from a wired connection. But I, I suspect, and I think that that's how you interpret it as well, is when he said he gets 10 to 12, he gets 10 to 12 doing wireless. Uh, maybe. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, if you get, uh, so yeah, so, so absolutely do a, a wired test to get a baseline and to, yeah, eliminate the, uh, the, whatever the bottleneck is here. Yeah, you'll know right away. Um, and, 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 and sure, if you do that wired test and the wired test comes up at, you know, 24 and your wireless test only shows 10. Okay. Well now you know where the discrepancy is, but I don't think that's what's mm. going to happen. Just, just yeah. simply because of the, Yeah, exactly. I had something very similar. So just to give you a, a situation where I verified that the problem was in fact, the wireless and not the wired is there's a certain room in my house, um, the throne, if you will, upstairs, where sometimes I'll bring my iOS device in there. And so I'm like, hey, let me run a speed test. And it's like, well, your speed isn't what you're paying for. And I'm like, well, that's not good. So I ran the Eero utility and saw that it had switched over for whatever reason to 2.4 gigahertz in that location, I suspect, because it's a bathroom and there's lots of tile and the five just wasn't cutting it. So it's like, you know what, I'm going to put you on 2.4. Because I just can't deal with five. Sure. So it was intentional, but but the thing is, and, and until I dug into the utility to determine that it was actually on two point four, that once I saw that, I'm like, oh well, that explains it because I'm not going to get the same throughput on two point four as as I will on five at this distance because yeah, it's very that, close. If you're close, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it downgraded to two point four because there's just something in the way, and it's like, oh. yeah, it could be duct work. It could be you know a refrigerator it could be stone i mean yeah or you could like your house's walls could be built as faraday cages john maybe oh yeah they could yeah all that metal they are (laughs) yeah all that metal intentionally built as a faraday cage yeah that's right that's highly unlikely highly unlikely we've seen it happen before we have i don't know that we I, i guess actually we have that's true you know while we're on the subject of troubleshooting wireless and 2.4 gigahertz wireless uh, I want to go to Debbie's question here, which handily was actually up next in the agenda anyway. Uh, Debbie yeah. wrote in with a sort of a question and a concern that I'd heard before, and I never really understood until I dug into it with Debbie. So Debbie's problem was she said that she bought, uh, and I want to describe them, she bought two E-Tech City, and that's E-T-E-K-C-I-T-Y, uh, outlet six-packs. And she said, and then learned that they have uh, a 2.4 gigahertz restriction. And what she said was, I have Eero networks in our home and our vacation home, which doesn't designate a separate 2.4 gigahertz network. So I can't get these set up. Is there, are there any workarounds? Do I have to buy an old Wi-Fi router just for the plug setup? So this got my head scratching, right? Because I've heard people say that with some Internet of Things devices, they The fact that they're routers and it, it, I mean, mesh isn't really the issue here, although most mesh routers do this, but so do a lot of others, uh, name the 2.4 gigahertz network and the five gigahertz network the same. And certainly that's our, that's been our advice for years, even before mesh, because you want to let your devices choose which one they're going to connect to. Well, When people would would tell me that they had some device or another, some Internet of Things device that only has a 2.4 gigahertz radio in it uh, and then would say, yeah, and I can't get it set up on my network. I would think, well, how in the world would the fact that both your 2.4 and 5 gigahertz networks being named like the fact that they're named the same is irrelevant because a a device with only a 2.4 gigahertz radio isn't even going to see any five gigahertz network. So it doesn't care what they're named. Like, why would this get in the way? And finally, finally this week, digging into it with Debbie, I finally figured out why this happens. And it's because the setup software for whatever her device is, 
inherits the hardware address, as, as we call it, the MAC address of the Wi-Fi network to which the iPhone that's setting it up is connected. So if the iPhone is connected to the five gigahertz network, the iPhone passes along the hardware address of that radio in the router to this device. And this device can't connect to that hardware address. Why? Because two different radios types. And so that's the issue. And to me, like that's an utter fail on the part of the device manufacturers or whoever oh, yeah. wrote the well, software. You, I mean, I can see the guy writing the software. He's like, hmm, should I connect via SSID or should I connect via MAC address? I think I'll connect via MAC address. That's a good idea, right? No. And it's like, no, no, it's a terrible I, idea. It's a terrible idea because let's say you change your router sometime and decide for this for your own sanity and consistency to just name the wireless network the same, keep the password the same. Like a lot of people do that. And it's common practice. And that would break any of these Internet of Things devices. Or let's say you set up one of these plugs and then move it to another part of your house where if you have a mesh system, it's closer to that mesh point. Well, it's not going to talk to anything but that very first radio that it, it connected to. So Eero's suggestion, which is sort of what made me realize what the actual problem was, was to get as far away from her home network as she could uh, so that the Eero or so that the phone would fall back to the 2.4 gigahertz network, kind of going to your story where, you know, some interference or just some distance, the range issue brings the five network, the five gigahertz network out of the picture and then do the setup of this plug. And I mean, I, I, I think that's the workaround to me. The workaround is return those get different plugs that don't know that don't act this way because it's such a huge shortcut for the software vendor to have, have taken that. I like, I, I can only imagine how this is going to like fail in an, in an awful way down the road. That's my, that's my thing. So there you go. And it's interesting in the chat room at macgeekgab.com slash stream. Michael King is saying uh, that TP link switches are the same way. Or, and I call these switches, which was a confusing part of my conversation with Debbie. It's a switched outlet. I'm not talking about Ethernet switches, just the switched outlet. So outlets. He, Michael King says TP links outlets are the same way and it sucks, which is interesting because I just set up a TP link outlet a couple of months ago and didn't run into this at all. Also didn't run into it with their webcam, but maybe those things have five gigahertz radios in them too. I don't, that I don't know. So, yeah. And the other issue could be, so our, our friend Brian Monroe mentions, and, and I, I've, I've seen this happen as well, uh, also on poor implementations, is you would assume in this day and age that everything supports WPA2 if it does Wi-Fi. Well, some things don't. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> true. Oh Yeah. So if, if the code that they have that's trying to implement WPA2 isn't implementing it properly, that's another fail. And that, you know, it's like, well, hello, you know, here's the password. And it's like, nope, nope. Right. I've heard right. that happening. Like, right. even, it, yeah, I mean, you would think in this day and age, it's like, okay, WPA2, um, five gigahertz, you know, support all the latest standards, but, but a lot of inexpensive devices. Yeah, totally. That's right. Yep. Aren't up with the latest standards. Like, oh, let's use WEP. It's like, no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, I want to take a minute now and uh, talk about our first sponsor. Is that all right with you, John? Excellent. Sweet. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro today, our sponsors, BB Edit from Barebone Software and BB Edit 12.1 includes a very important new feature, and that is that BB Edit is now a fully 64-bit app. Uh, that means that it's going to be compatible with, you know, operating systems going forward. Apple has officially announced that 64-bit support is deprecated and will be removed. I believe it will be removed from Mac OS in 2019. So that's next year. You mean 32? 32 will not be allowed. Sorry, thank you. See, this is why I have you here, John. Thank you. Well, same with iOS, I think. iOS, yeah, uh, uh, it's already there. iOS purge? Yeah, it's All already right, So there. iOS is no longer 32-bit. That's right. And uh, Mac OS will follow. Yep. Okay. And so BB Edit now, 64-bit. They also added new touch bar support in 12.1. And uh, with all of this stuff, 
they 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 now get faster performance and it opens larger files. And I noticed this actually. I have some huge files that I wind up scrolling through, and scrolling behavior was way faster with twelve point one. So I was really really impressed to see that just sort of sneak out as an update earlier this week. BB Edit, one of my favorite pieces of software because of how smoothly it works and how much I can do with it. In addition to the fact that they've made these under the hood changes, you know, BB Edit is the thing that I use all day to edit little text documents. It doesn't try to apply any formatting to the saved document, but if you open something up that's like got some JavaScript in it or Really anything in any language, HTML, C++, C Sharp, whatever, it doesn't matter. It figures out what language you're in and starts highlighting things just visually so that you can see it. Uh, but if you're just working with regular text files, then it, they just look like regular text files. It's, it like doesn't get in your way until it thinks it has something to do very nicely for you. And if you're a terminal person, maybe yet it's awesome because you can install their command line tools and it will offer to do this when you start it up. And then from the terminal, if you want to edit a file, you just type BB edit space, the file name. So you got to check it out. Go to barebones.com. Check out BB edit 12.1. There's a demo that you can download for free and you can actually use that demo for free forever. And then there's some features that are only available in the pro version or the, the paid version, I should say. Go check it out. Barebones.com. Our thanks to Barebones and BB edit for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Uh, we've had some people, well, we have some issues and that's a good thing. I mean, it's not a good thing, but it does sort of define how we do the show. If people stopped having issues, we would, I guess we'd just have to make the show tips all the time. Wouldn't we? I mean, there'd be nothing left to do. I got issues, man. Yeah. <laughs> Same. Talk about uh, those later. That's right. Uh, all right, Dan going to Dan here. Uh, I will get us there. Dan says, uh, a friend of mine has a MacBook Pro from late 2011, which he recently got an SSD put in. In attempting to update from High Sierra 10.3.2 to 10.3.3, sorry, 10.13.2 to 10.13.3, I blame the Flexoril, uh, he gets a message that some updates could not be installed. So it's almost as if the update didn't fully install, as when he checks in about this Mac, it still says he's on 10.13.2. Any thoughts on this would be appreciated. Yeah, I am. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with his SSD. I could be wrong on that. And if I am, like I said, we just blame the Flexorel. I don't actually like this stuff, but I begrudgingly admit that it helps my back. Uh, but I don't think it's related to the SSD. I, I experienced a similar thing on a, on a 2011 MacBook Air trying to upgrade from 13.2 to 13.3. And it, it the same thing, like it went through what appeared to be the process. And when it started back up, I don't know, something seemed like nothing had changed. So I went and checked about this Mac and it was like, oh yeah, there's, it's still dot two. So I had to do it again. And then it updated just fine. If your friends doesn't update, I would say try in safe mode. Um, and I guess if that doesn't work, John, we go to recovery mode and, and just reinstall the OS on top of itself. <sighs> There's nothing wrong with that. Like, don't erase the disk. No, there's nothing wrong with it, but I have an additional suggestion, having surfed far and wide to Go. find all the people that had this problem. Yeah. Here's another thing. Rather than applying the update that you download via the App Store, you may want to download it directly. Oh, I like that. Oh, yeah. I've duh. Seen, Why not? Yeah. I've, seen, I've seen sometimes... Um, the standalone installers work when the others don't. The other thing I've had happen. So, so I think the last major update that I did, Dave, uh, the, to High Sierra, I actually had where I installed it. It got to a certain point in the install process, and then the progress bar was just stuck. And it wasn't moving. Right. And I'm like, all right. <clears throat> so I did what I'm going to tell you to do now is I think I, you know, uh, rebooted this, you know, uh, uh, did a, you know, hard, hard power down. You hold down the power button for five seconds and the machine shut down and then I restarted it and I downloaded the standalone updater and everything was better. <laughs> Dude, that that's way better than any of my ideas. Like that's the thing that you should start yeah, with, Dan. It happens every now and then. Now, <laughs> where can you find these? You may ask. And, uh, well, this is kind of a different URL here. Um, 
But normally, if you go to support.apple.com slash downloads, let me just verify this. It, it put some extra garbage in there. It put like underscore. It. Okay, no. So yeah, if you go to support.apple.com slash downloads, you will then see browse downloads by product. And one of the products is Mac OS. You click on that and then it'll show you all the latest updaters. So in closing, the standalone updater may be better than the one that you download from the app store. Because as far as I know, they're, they should be the same, but I don't think they are. Well, it's possible that the um, app store updater is just the incremental and is not the combo, right? Right. And what do we mean by that? So there are different types of updates. You know, I'm looking at the updates as of late, Dave, and they don't seem to distinguish between the combo and just... Mm. Yeah, but I'll tell you the well, the 10.13.2, uh, we're looking for it here, but the 13.2 oh, no, no, right. combo updater is three gigs in size. I don't think the, the one you download from the, uh, the app store is that big. Right. Yeah. No, I see that. So, so I think typically, so the... Um, so the combo updater is all right. So so the combo is the is that the incremental or the, no. no 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 the combo is oh, so the everything combo from is, dot is the whole zero. shebang. Yep, that's right. All right. So the normal installer will assume that you're on the prior dot release, right? Yes. Whereas the combo will will be able to handle an upgrade from something. Within that dot range, right? Yes. So if it's a 10.13.3 combo updater, that means it can update any system from 10.13.0 forward. That's right. And okay. and it and as a troubleshooting mechanism or tool, the combo updater is used because if there's something that like if there's something that changed that got damaged or whatever that was say in the 10.13.1 update, just doing the uh the you know the the 13.2 to 13.3 the incremental updater you wouldn't necessarily get that so that's that's often why it's it's chosen but in this case it's i mean it's great cuz you you have everything locally contained and you're not relying on the internet and you have the whole updater uh so yeah no this that's great great advice good thing all right let's see if we can get dan yule's problem uh and i say dan yule because we just did dan so uh, Daniel writes, he says, I have a small office using a Mac mini as a server without Mac OS server to share a folder on the network. Five users log into the server share using the credentials of the one main admin account on the server. The shared folder is an active Google Drive folder with 300 gigs of stuff. The issue, he says, increasingly and more so since updating all Macs in this office to high Sierra is that they're experiencing hard freezes and require hard restarts on their individual Macs anytime they create folders on the share. Uh, he said, do you think having Google Drive folder as the land share is a bad practice that it might cause problems? Or is this more of an issue because they all log in with one account uh, or perhaps an issue because they're using Microsoft Office 2011, but now they're using Microsoft Office 2016 because, of course, 2011 won't run in High Sierra, uh, or at least it won't run well. And uh, so that's sort of out of the thing. So um, in general, I wouldn't expect any of these kinds of problems, but uh, but obviously you are having these problems. So troubleshooting time, right? Step one, let's disable Google Drive syncing on the server machine. Just turn it off, quit the app and, and let's see. Then go and create folders and see if they still experience lockups. Well, then we know it wasn't Google Drive doing it. Uh, I would find it hard to believe that it was, but, you know, stranger things, right? So uh, assuming Google Drive isn't the problem, uh, check and see how you're connecting from the client machines to this, right? Because there's there's essentially two ways. There's AFP, which is the old way, Apple file protocol. And then the new way is SMB, server messaging block, or I think that's right, right? And um and that's, it was, I mean, it was a Windows standard, but now it's standard on the Macs too. So that I, that's how I would suggest doing it now, especially with High Sierra. Really anything since Mavericks, I think SMB is the way to go. So I would do that. And the one account thing, really, I don't think that's a problem. I, I mean, I think there's a 10 user limit doing it that way. 
uh, without Mac OS server software, at least they used to be, but that, I mean, you're below that. So, um, I, I kind of feel like we're going to run through all of these though, and still have the problem. And at that point it would be, all right, boot it in safe mode, you know, Onyx on the server. I mean, it, I think it's a server problem given that the client machines, all of them are doing it, but it's also worth looking. Is there anything on the client machines that would, you know, that's consistent, some third party thing or a non-standard setting or something that would cause this? I don't know. That's what do you think? I would suggest exploring a different option for a file server. Yes, technically, well, why? you can share file. Um, I mean, it's a Mac. I, I understand that. I'm, I'm just offering a suggestion. <laughs> Although you, you should be able, but, but I've heard tales of woe in the past that people trying to use a, a standalone Mac not running server as a file server. And although you should be able to, in this case, it's not working. So I'm just saying you may want to think about a standalone solution for sharing the files. Well, maybe you'll shake your fist at me and you can shake your fist at me, but the, I, I, it, it's just the thought of my mind is like, you know, rather than agonizing over trying to solve this problem, I, sure. I agree it's annoying and it should work, but it's not. So, I mean, yeah. maybe the Google thing is a part of it. Maybe there's some Microsoft wackiness that that's causing it. Um, you know, it was mentioned. Uh, I'm not sure why those two things came to the top, but yeah, yeah. As, I, as, uh, I, suspicious so vec suspicion vectors. <laughs> the the chat room is is blowing up with everybody saying it's Google Drive, it's Google Drive, it's Google Drive. Oh, all right. so uh, so maybe it very very well is, and then there you go. Right, step one of the troubleshooting would have gotten us there. Um, I do like that idea the the general concept of using Google Drive or Dropbox or, you know, some cloud syncing service to keep your data backed up. Now, you could also do a private cloud with, you know, a Synology or something. But I like that idea because it's just backing up your data constantly. And if you have a, a cloud syncing service that offers, you know, some level of uh, recovery. So if you delete a file, you can go and get it back, which Dropbox certainly does. And I, I'm pretty sure Google drive does too. Then you're getting, you know, some, something approximating a backup of that that's happening in real time all the time. So, uh, so I like the idea, but if Google drives desktop software is causing this problem, well then, you know, pick something else. So I mean, the other go. thing, but I, I, I do, I do want to say, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with your assessment that running a Mac without Mac OS server as a server is a bad idea. I, I mean, it's literally the same server software oh, I know. on there, even when you're running Mac OS server, it's just a different admin uh, interface. Right. So I like, uh, I, I mean, I get it. If it's a problem, then move to something else, but it, it, there, it shouldn't be a problem, especially no, with a user load like this. So it shouldn't be, but right. It may be. <laughs> it might. Oh, I it, totally. Yes, I, I agree. But if it I is, mean, I would is, wipe it clean and, and like start the OS from scratch mm -hmm. like that. That could certainly be a solution or combo updater, you know, so. <sighs> right. Yeah, I had something floating around the back of my mind Sorry. as far as another option here, but. um. <sighs> Now, so we have this, I mean, sharing files. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So it locking up. So I want to address the locking up thing. Mm. So sometimes what appears to be a lockup may not be a lockup. And that you'll see the spinning uh, rainbow of death. Or, sure. Or, or, uh, the, the spinning rainbow of eternal weight. Sometimes that goes away. So sometimes computers get confused networks get confused and they're all just fighting with each other trying to figure out how to do the right thing or do what you ask you may want to either just wait it out sometimes i've seen these things bounce back and they they clear out whatever the congestion was um it could be a network related thing too i don't know if you know you got a sketchy network but that's a whole other story but the other thing is that if you're able to still have control of the machine maybe go into activity monitor and see who's upset, right? Yeah. Sometimes I found that useful when 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 the system when, when I have a system that wedges. Sometimes I'm like, all right, who's being stupid? 
<laughs> Let me get activity monitor up here. And typically an activity monitor, um, however you list the processes, the thing is if something's misbehaving, it'll usually show up in red. And it'll say, you know, I'm wedged or I'm, I'm stuck. And I, I, don't, I, I don't understand what's going on. Right, right. Um, so let me help refine your theory as to who's causing this. And it could, in fact, be that a Microsoft Office component or a Dropbox component or a, a whatever file sharing you're using may just be having a bad day. Um, but Activity Monitor can, should show you that. Yeah, right. that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'll either see it like wedged and using 0% CPU or you'll see it using, you know, maximum CPU. And so that's like, you know. And again, it's go. usually in red when something's, when the OS considers something to be a lost cause, it'll put it up in red and say not responding. So. Right, right. Give that a try the next time this happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'd be curious what that is. You know, I mean, I'm trying to think, and I know we're kind of going down the rat hole here, but... <laughs> Google Drive and, and yeah, but like Google Drive and Dropbox and uh, and even, you know, like Synology's Cloud Station or Synology's Drive all do things to change the finders icons to show when something is being synced or it has been successfully synced. So you can just get a visual confirmation of the state of that particular file or folder. And if Google Drive's doing this and then for whatever reason, the clients are trying to inherit these folder icons or whatever uh, across the server, across the network from the server. Eh, that might be it. So I don't know. It's it's people in the chat room are saying use um, iCloud drive and, or, you know, a, a paid Dropbox account. I mean, it's going to be a paid iCloud drive account to, to, uh, to do it. They've, they've had better luck with that. So, so there we go. Hey, I got a, uh, I got a couple of uh, cool stuffs found here, John. Cool stuff found. Yeah, cool stuffs found. I think it's cool stuffs found. Cool's stuff yeah, found. That's good. Okay. Uh, the first is oh, we're gonna find it here. Why can't I see anything? I blame the uh, the flexorel. Okay. Uh, the first is from listener John, who says, "Have you ever wanted to transfer that amazing Spotify Spotify playlist to Apple Music? Have I got the app for you? It's called Song Shift." And it's free with an in-app purchase and will move your playlist from Spotify to Apple Music, from Pandora to Apple Music, from Pandora to Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. And it does. In addition to the three we already mentioned, it supports Deezer and Discogs and Last.fm and Napster and Tidal and YouTube and all of that. So we will put a link to that in the show notes because that is pretty cool. I know I would have liked that. What uh, I would have liked that. You know, back when I migrated from a Spotify account to an Apple Music account. So with the HomePod just coming out, I think there's probably going to be a lot of people that might want something like this. So we will put uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Pretty cool, huh, John? Hmm. No? Mm, not for me, but. All right. Well, that's sure okay. It doesn't have to many. be for everybody. I don't need it, but, you know, it could be good for somebody out there. Sharing is good. Sharing is good. Sharing is good. All right. And then uh, Joe, because we do a podcast here, uh, said, uh, I recently needed to find a way to distribute recordings of my local church's weekly service talks. I figured that a podcast would be the easiest medium with which to reach the maximum number of people who attend church whilst needing the minimum amount of work to produce rather than burning CDs or making USB sticks. So then I started a journey on which I discovered the podcast generator app, which is available on the Synology disk station, along with a crash course on the best way of getting audio from our sound desk to my iPad. I now have a podcast server sitting on my disk station, serving up audio and video podcast seems to be very reliable and hasn't had any hiccups since I set it up. The developer's done an amazing job of keeping the product going and even has a forum dedicated to it where he offers support. Uh, he then goes on to describe how it creates everything and it makes XML feeds and all this great stuff. So uh, that, I think that's pretty cool, man. Thanks for sharing that with us, Joe. Pretty good. Right, John? I got one. Can I offer Go, one? please. Yeah. Just off the top of my head. Yeah, man. So I was surfing the other day and somebody mentioned this piece of software. If we if we talked about it before, then let me know. But 
Have you heard of Sound Source? From Rogue Amoeba? Okay. I, yeah. Well, I, I have, but I don't think we've ever mentioned it in this show. I, I will look that up, but, but please go ahead and tell people about it. Yeah. Well, I, I want to kick the tires on it, but um, it, it was mentioned in my timeline, my Twitter timeline, but somebody said, hey, by the way, you know what's really cool is that Rogue Amoeba is offering Sound Source. If you already have another of their products licensed, you get it for free. <laughs> and because I license now, of course, you know, we're, we're, you know, rock stars, so we could get licenses for pretty much anything, but I still threw down coin for piezo because that, I, I want to pay these guys. I, because, yeah. <laughs> I have tried to pay for audio hijack for years. It's like, dude, I literally use it to make my living. He's like, yeah, but you know, I want you to have it like, right. They're great. Same. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's funny. So somebody basically uh, posted saying, Hey, if you, you know, have a license to any of their other products, which I do, then sound source license is free and they have a mechanism where you punch in your number and they're like, okay, here you go. But it's basically a, a well, as they say, the sound control that should be built into Mac OS. So all I'll say is that I haven't worked with it a lot, but it looks like something to explore. It's just basically a nicer way of selecting your input and output devices. Oh, it's super Apple's. handy. I, I love sound source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have not mentioned it on this show, John. I checked our, our notes. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, there you go. Um, yeah. Oh, so if you guys want to get into the exciting world of where your sound is coming from and going to, then uh, this looks to be a better option than offered in Mac OS. Yeah, so. that's the way to go. Cool. Wow, I'm glad you mentioned that, man. That's a good one. Hey, uh, speaking of sound and all that, I, uh, you know, I figured we should take a minute here today. We don't have to take very long and talk a little bit about the HomePod. Now, I, I got one. Uh, I had it delivered Friday. John, you did not get one, correct? correct. No, I okay. um, <clears throat> doesn't sound like it's for me, but, you know, hey, I mean, for you. Well, hey, well, I'm not convinced go. it's for D me either. I, I mean, but but. I, I okay, because it, it it seems to. Uh, I mean, is it a music device? Is it a home control hub? Kind of like the A word, or the, or is it kind of both, or is it kind of neither? Is it who 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 who's the audience here? And I I think you're an excellent candidate to determine. Yeah, so I I would call it. I mean, it's all of the above, certainly in various capacities. You know, Apple has done a very good job making sure we understand that they see it as a music device first and that they added Siri to. Right. And and certainly in using it, it feels like that because, as has been covered in many places, uh, Siri support is I, I, limited it is the right word to use, but it might come with it the wrong implication. You don't have the full Siri feature set, but you have a lot of it um, and certainly enough of it to play music because that's what the device is, is built for. You could also ask it about the weather and, and things like that. But if you start asking it about like things that might require a web search or something, it it's like, no, not here. But do you get, uh, for example, a uh, sorry, I stopped myself. You did. You did. <laughs> so she um, has skills. Yeah, yeah. Um, so right, HomePod doesn't have anything. There's no third-party no integrations with HomePod okay, okay. right now. Yep. All right, and, so that's a differentiator right there. Yeah, and I don't know that there ever will be. I mean, we, you know, Apple hasn't said it. It would be just as easy to assume that Apple will offer third-party integrations or apps as it is to assume that they never will, right? Because this is Apple. Um, as a as a speaker, it sounds great. I'm I'm not like. I want to get that out right up front. It sounds great and it looks great. And if you are someone that doesn't have an easy way to play music out loud at home and you are either an Apple music subscriber or want to be one or want to live in the Apple ecosystem fully and don't care whether or not it ever supports third party music services, then this is absolutely a speaker that you should consider for your for your home. Because seven years ago, when I finally made the jump to Sonos, right, that was really the only option at the time for streaming or, or listening to your you know, local library, local digital library being streamed uh, easily out loud, right? They were the only ones doing the convenient, out loud, decent sounding audio. And it changed my life. 
right? We had gone from listening to CDs all the time. Then we digitized all our CDs and we literally like within a year stopped listening to music out loud uh, because it was just a pain in the neck to, to do it. And, and then, you know, we went probably five or six years and then Sonos kind of entered our lives and it was like, Oh, you know, yay. Finally, again, like our room, our, our home can be warmed with music and it's been that way ever since. But if you, it, so for me looking at HomePod, it's like, well, I need another speaker. Like I need a hole in the head. Right. I mean, I've got 13 rooms in our Sonos <laughs> system. I, it, it would take a lot to convince me to just walk away from that. And uh, and HomePod isn't that a lot. Y you know, it sounds great to my ears. I don't like it as much as I like uh, like a Sonos one. Um, the HomePod is quiet. It's not as loud as the Sonos one. It has way too much low end for my tastes. But again, it's not so much that it's it's <laughs> it, it, it it like it doesn't it doesn't ruin the listening experience. It's just like, Whoa, more bass, you know, like, wow. It's like, now, it has something to prove. Right. And, and that's fine. Well, I, I know a lot of people have shake their fist at Bose because Bose tends to overextend the low end as well. No and highs, no actually... lows must be Bose. That's what all the sound engineers say, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily subscribe to that, but, but I, I, you know, but I saw in my feed, fun. I think Jeff, uh, our own Jeff Gamut yeah. uh, also, uh, uh, Pointed out that the low end, uh, the, there may be a bit too much low end for his yeah. taste on the uh, on. It it kind of feels like the out loud equivalent of the Beats headphone signature, right? It's that low end thing, like okay, yeah. but you know what? Do they have an EQ? Is That's there an the EQ? thing. No, there's oh. not. And, oh, come and on, you can't like, like yeah, you like Sonos does the uh, their own version of an auto room tuning thing, but it's not that. It's like the HomePod's auto room tuning is pretty cool. I'll tell you a thing in a minute about that. That was kind of fun. But uh, like you just, you know, set it up and it does it. You don't have to like wait, walk around the room waving your, your phone like a, a, you know, like a divining rod or anything. It just <laughs> works. And it does a good job. And it gets that consistent sound signature anywhere I put it. So but nobody likes one like th there's no universal. Good. EQ, right? There's some universal bad ones I think we could probably come up with. But it but you know, we all have different preferences. We're all deaf in different ways. We all want, you know, slightly different things. Um and and music listening is a very subjective thing. And some people just want to drop the bass, Dave. Well, that's it. And I then, understand that. And that, that, that you know, it's a it's a, almost a primal urge, but some people just want lots of bass. Some people it, it, there's and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, like, you know, well, yeah, there is actually. No, there's not. I mean, it, like, it, you know, and I put up a piece today explaining like all my thoughts on this, but also saying like, if you disagree with me, that's OK. Uh, you know, like it, it's because your preference is your preference. I, You know, and I and again, I like this is me being super hypercritical. As I listened to this thing, you know, I would I would play the same song on, say, you know, the JBL Link 500, which is a three hundred ninety nine dollar speaker that has Google Assistant in it. Then I would play it on the HomePod at three forty nine and then I would play it on the Sonos one at one ninety nine. And I'd kind of go back and forth and I get very particular about each of them. And I was like finding things that I didn't like about one. I liked about the other. But if I let the music play long enough, I would forget and I would just enjoy listening to the song. Like any one of those speakers is awesome. It sounds great. It sounds so much better than your phone speaker or, you know, the crappy Bluetooth speaker that you might have to play music out loud in the kitchen or better than the Amazon, you know, Echo for sure. Uh, I haven't tested the Google Max. I've heard that sounds pretty good. Um, but, you know, like having decent quality audio in your house, the HomePod definitely delivers. Um, it's a really, really good speaker. It's just that, you know, you could get a Sonos one for one ninety nine or two, a pair of Sonos ones for three forty nine, the same price and really fill your room with sound. So, uh, you, you, but you have to decide which way you want to go. And, and any of those paths is going to result in you having awesome sound in your house. So the auto tuning, John, you're going to love this. I set the thing up and, uh, and I noticed like, at one spot in my kitchen, I put it on our counter and I'm like, well, how come it sounds like it's sending the vocals away from me? 
this is weird. Like the counter is kind of in the middle of the room. And I'm like, you know, I've got like the front of it or the part with the cord aimed away from me. So I would assume it would, you know, direct the sound this way. And I'm like, all right, well, fine. So I just turn the speaker around. But of course, when you jostle the speaker in any way, the motion sensor inside says, uh, no, no, I got to recalibrate. So it would go through its recalibration. And again, the sound was pointing away from me. I'm like, all right, what's going on? And finally, so I put my head like I looked down at the top of the speaker while it was playing so that I could hear where the, you know, where the vocals were going. And sure enough, they were always going away from where I wanted them to go. And then I realized I had a salt shaker on the count on the kitchen counter close, but not right up next to it was maybe six inches away from the speaker from the HomePod. But, you know, the HomePod's microphones are around the kind of the middle of the device. And what was happening was the sound was reflecting off of the salt shaker perfectly to hit a microphone. And I I assume the HomePod was deciding, okay, there's a wall there. That means that the front of the speaker is the other direction. (laughs) I moved the salt shaker. I shook the speaker enough to, you know, force it to recalibrate. Everything was fine. So there you go. Well, at least you didn't lose your salt shaker because that's a big problem. No, you don't want to lose it. Yeah, we did post an article today. Brian Monroe in the chat room reminded me we posted an article about changing the EQ. It, kind of. Um, I, the article was originally unclear. I think we've we've updated it since. You can EQ. You, the HomePod can be an AirPlay destination, and certainly if whatever you're sending AirPlay audio from can adjust the EQ, then that will be heard on the HomePod. So you right. can adjust the EQ well, on your iTunes iPhone. iTunes has an EQ Exactly. Panel. Exactly. So, but that doesn't change the EQ of the HomePod. It just changes the EQ of what you're sending to it from, say, your Mac. But if you ask the HomePod to play, you know, the Rolling Stones or whatever you want to listen to, it's going to stream that directly to itself, and the EQ changes you made in iTunes are irrelevant at that point. Yeah. But Real. I did. Yeah, but I did ask it. I said, hey, S, uh, turn down the bass. And what it said to me was, I can't control that setting from HomePod. So I think ah. there, is, there is a setting. We just, we just can't get so to it yet. It's telling you what you can't do, mm-hmm. but it didn't tell you what you can do. Correct. <laughs> Correct. It's like, by the way, if you want to yeah. change this, yeah. uh, go here. But it didn't offer that information. So it, it you you're going to have good. to beat it out of her. You're, you're just going to have to, uh, to try to convince her to give you yeah, the secret. Exactly. <laughs> so, that, you know, that's that's I, that's it. I, I think that software updates are going to come uh, plentifully and quickly. Because there's a lot like every issue that I have with it, short of the fact that it's just not that loud, um, is totally a software issue. Right. You want to change the EQ. Just give me the software control and it'll do it. You know. All right. But let me ask you this. Yeah. So say I'm a person that doesn't have any Apple devices at all. Is this something I would want? No. Okay. In fact, you definitely don't want it because you need, I think, an iPhone 5 or maybe a 5S or later to set it up. Yeah. And maybe... A subscription to an Apple Music type service. You need not just an Apple useful? Music type service. You need <laughs> Apple Music. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the requirement is you need probably an iOS device or a Mac. No, you uh, need an uh, you need an iOS device. You can't okay. configure it with your Mac. All right. So you need an iOS device and you need a subscription to Apple Music. Are the yeah. I mean, you can AirPlay this. to it okay. without a subscription. Right. And if you want, you can also. So it's a destination. It's an AirPlay destination, but then yeah, that's kind of an expensive speaker. <laughs> yeah, All you're using well, it for as a destination, right? Yeah, I mean, there's it. It there well, are AirPlay not, destinations know. that are also like you know pretty pricey, and you can AirPlay to it from your Apple TV. Believe it or not, I I did that, hmm. and it works. That's really where it's it's lack of ability to get loud became an issue because we couldn't hear like dialogue and stuff. It was like, we, you know, our living room is like, I think it's like 15 by 25. So, the, the you know, we were sitting on the couch. Maybe the speaker was 15 feet from us or something. And it was like, hmm, can't really hear it. So, yeah. 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 So, all right. all right. We've got a bunch of follow ups and questions from previous episodes that I want to dig back into. So, 
Uh, Giles is where we will go next. And Giles, I will find you, says uh, he was the one that we talked about uh, his iPad. He wanted he wanted to copy his movies from his iTunes library, sorry, to his daughter's iPad. And he set up different accounts and he wanted to know how to configure the uh, the iTunes library with his daughter to point to the external drive that had it. And he did that. You know exactly what we explained to him and and it worked. So if you want to go back to that, you can go to 695. But then he said he had a problem because when he went to convert or when he went to sync these things to the iPad, he would get an error message saying it was not copied because the video format is not supported by the iPad. Uh, He then found the setting in iTunes where you can go to iTunes, file, convert, create iPad or Apple TV version he said, I took, I tried this on one file. It took about 10 minutes to complete. I couldn't see any difference at all in the get info panel of the file in iTunes, but it did sync. So what gives, what bit of these files is incompatible? I don't want to have to go through the process of reconverting them all. You're right. iTunes is really, really picky about what it will convert. And it could be the order of the audio tracks in that. Uh, movie that's one thing to check it could be the file container like maybe it's m4v versus m uh, mp4 uh there there's very very particular things that itunes needs before it will copy the movie but the trick is your ipad's pretty capable on its own so if you could get that movie onto it it would play it in fact, there's a lot of movies that your iPad will play or your iPhone will play that iTunes won't sync over to it. What's that, John? No. Oh, okay. Uh, and thankfully, there's a piece of software called Walter, W-A-L-T-R, that is built to take those movies and shove them into the movies app on your iPad so that you don't have to mess with it anymore. It's at softarino.com. And that is Walter W A L T R. So that that's where I would go with this is, uh, is just, you know, dump Walter onto it. If you want to go a different direction, um, you could use something like uh, infuse from Firecore, which is a video player app that you install on the iPad or iPhone. And then you can copy things into Infuse's library, and it's very uh, forgiving about what you want to give it. It'll even do some on-device processing if it has to to get the movie to display. So that would be the other way to go is, is using Infuse from Firecore. So you got any other thoughts on this, John? Huh. Uh, just being annoyed that it's very nonspecific. <laughs> well, yeah, that's its job, John. <laughs> when it says... The video format is not supported. It's like, well, which ones are? Maybe you could tell me. Mm. No. No. No, no. But it will convert it for you. So, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But it's, I don't think in this case, I don't think it's doing any converting. I think it's just remuxing it and ordering it how it, how it wants it. Because 10 minutes is, I mean, I don't know how fast your computer is, man, but 10 minutes is pretty good to reconvert a movie. (laughs) I don't think it's actually doing that. I think it's just copying it around. Hey, uh, we talked about vector photos or vector images on the past couple of shows, and we have one last entry into the uh, to throw into the ring for vector app editors, and that is Affinity Designer. Um, And then they also have Affinity Photos, which is kind of their Photoshop competitor. Each app is 50 bucks, so way cheaper than what you would pay Adobe for their apps. but as we were prepping the show, John, you suggested that we should at least briefly explain what a vector image is versus a non-vector image. Do you want to take that or, or is was that just a suggestion? For oh, me? yeah. No. That, okay, good. No, it's awesome. I just, the, the, what is a vector, Victor? Uh, <laughs> if you've watched their plane, then you'll understand our reference. But um, so what do we mean when we, when we talked about vector graphics? And I think the thing is, at, at the very basic level a vector is a quantity that includes two things a magnitude which is a value and a direction what does that mean when we're talking about images though 
Well, the thing is, there's a couple of ways you can construct an image, Dave. I think. I think there's two major ways. One, you could have a bitmap, which is just bits yep. that you see, and they're pretty. Another way you could build a, 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 an image, Dave, is you could construct it by a series of vectors saying, OK, well, you know, a series of here. lines, I think, is a, a, a perhaps a, a better way to sort of translate that. Probably. Yeah. 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 So the thing is, you, you can also describe an object but, in a series a, of vectors. Right. It's a now, it may take a lot of them. Right. It's a description it's like, right, of what start it looks here, like. you yeah. know, start here and then go in this direction for this amount of time and then go in this direction. So it's, it's a different way of representing an object. And the nice part about it is that with a, an image that's, that's described with pixels, it is one size. You can take that image and sample it down to make it smaller. But if you sample it up to make it bigger than it actually is, things start getting very jagged because it doesn't know what to do uh, your computer doesn't know what to do with these pixels, so it just doubles them or triples them or whatever to make it bigger. But it's not actually more data, whereas a vector image that's a description of what things should look like that is literally redrawn every time it's displayed on your screen can be displayed at any size and it will look clear at every size because it's being redrawn at that size from this list of, uh, from this description, all these vectors. Right. So and I think we benefit. saw this. Yeah. And I think we saw this in the, in, in the, the early days of fonts. Right. We, we saw had, this. We had bitmap like fonts said, and vector fonts. Yeah. So the thing is you could have a bitmap font. All right. So I need one version for 10 point, one for 12 point, one for, and oh my gosh, or I could just store a way of representing or drawing with vectors, the characters. And the thing is, I don't need a file for each size. I just, whatever size you want. Okay. I'll, I'll start drawing it now. Yep. Computationally, that can be taxing. There's extra work. That's right. Which and is you why I figure am- out. How yep. to draw that, but then most modern computers, you know, can kind of handle that. <laughs> yep, totally. Cool. All right. Well, I, I just wanted to make sure we kind of went through that. All right. Now, going, uh, moving along to Patrick, a quick tip from the, uh, or related, I should say, to the last episode. He said, thanks for the tips in 695 concerning shortcuts with the finer and terminal to remind people, uh, command shift period shows or toggles the, the uh, showing of hidden files. And then from the finder, you are, are to open a uh, folder in the finder that you're from the terminal, you get to the folder in the terminal and type open space period. He said, but I have a tip because sometimes when you're using the finder, you have a file or folder that you want to open in the terminal to go essentially the reverse of the open space period tip. One quick way is to select the file or folder in the finder and copy it with the command C command. Open up terminal. And when you paste with command V, it pastes the path to that file or folder, not the actual contents of the folder itself. He said, sometimes uh, I'd rather use Vim to view a text file instead of text edit. He says, or I have a script to run a process on a folder. Instead of trying to type out the entire path of the folder, I can use this method. He says, in other words, it's essentially the open pl- open period tip uh, in reverse. So that's pretty cool. I uh, I always forget that you can copy and paste a file path there. Um, I know I've done it, but every time I think about how to do it, it's like, man, I don't know how to do it. And that's because it's super simple. You just do it. There's nothing to it. There you go. Anything else on that one, John, before we move on to uh, to Thomas here? Oh, Thomas. Go. Oh, he's got an awesome one. Sweet. At least I think so. Cool. So Thomas says, I just listened to MacyCap 694 where you talk about Mac OS server. You mentioned that the device management feature is just a local thing, maybe just as the Apple configurator is. This is not the case. Device manager in macOS server is a fully working MDM server with remote updates and mostly the same possibilities that other MDM servers have, mostly because there are features missing which other MDM servers have. Got it. So so the reason these other MDM servers, MDM stands for mobile device management. 
Um, and the reason that they exist is because they offer things that Apple's uh, own server does not. That's interesting, though. I had no idea that macOS server had a like a fully you know remote uh, MDM thing set up. Uh, so the thing is, we that's were great. And so I experiment with it a little bit, Dave, but I think it's worth looking at, especially for the price of Mac OS right. server and the fact that they said they're going to focus on device management. So right now, the thing is, my fish shake with them is that so I have Mac OS server, as, as I'm sure you do. Um, under the So when you start a Mac OS server, it'll list different categories, server accounts, services. And under services, my fish shake was they don't have a service called device management. Well, it's called Profile Manager. Okay. Oh, okay. The thing is, if you go to Profile Manager, and normally it's off, and you turn it on, then it goes through this whole series of calisthenics. <laughs> I'm sorry, just operations. Yeah. So it creates a bunch of certificates, because the thing it's going to present you with eventually is a web page on that machine that allows you to register and manage devices. Got it. It's really a pretty elegant, um, once you know that it's there, it's like, wow. So the thing is, I started up and made some certs. The cool thing is that the certificates that it generates, when you go to the web page to do further configuration, it shows up as an SSL page, but it doesn't give you a warning that it's a self-signed certificate. So it's doing uh -oh. some magic in the background to put it into your keychain oh. to say, this is well, this is cool because you generated it. And then there's like a sub, you know, a, a intermediate yeah. certificate. But I didn't get any warnings when I went to the page. I'm like, well, wait, it's secure. How can it be secure if I didn't get a cert issued by, you know, a big guy? Yeah. And it's like, well, because that's how this works. <laughs> right. Because right. Then you yeah, can go yeah, to yeah. then you can go to a page and then Dave. Uh, uh, so at least the, the, the way they advertise to use it. So I registered two devices. So I registered my iPhone. And my Mac. Now, the Mac thing gets really interesting, but the iPhone. So I register the iPhone things. Once you register it, and then you get to the point where you can list your devices yeah. through the web interface, it's pretty much very similar to Apple Configurator 2. In that okay. You create what's known as a profile. Um, in, in this case, with server, you can push it to the device. Um, I haven't... I've just scratched the surface, but the first thing that I did with my iOS device. So once my iOS device, so I went to the web page offered by the server on my machine and I said, register the device. And then through the administration interface, um, I said, oh, okay, it, it sees this device. It's like, well, what do you want to restrict or, or let it do? And I'm like, well, um, how about you disable the camera? Because <laughs> that's one of the things you can sure. do. So I'm like, okay. So I clicked on disable camera and then said, okay, push this to the device. The, the first time the device, whether it be a Mac or iOS, it says, okay, uh, I got this configuration profile that somebody wants to install. Is that cool? And it's like, yeah, because that's how this works. That, right. that's how, it, it's through the standard mechanism. But the thing that was cool, Dave, was so as soon as I set it up on my Mac saying, okay, push this to my iOS device, seconds later, all of a sudden the camera app disappeared. Wow. <laughs> it oh, just yeah. disappeared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty kind of cool. similar if I did it with the configurator. So, so the the point that's being made is that um, it's over the air. It, it's a it, it's a more sophisticated version. It, it's a, a centralized server based version of what you can do with the configurator. Plus a little more, Dave, because I also register my Mac. Now the thing is, Apple Configurator Two, last I checked, doesn't let you administer or send profiles to Macs. But this does, because when I configured my Mac, so I, uh, like with my iOS device, I went to the server and said, yeah, hi, this is me. I'm, I'm the Mac. And it's like, OK, that's cool. Here's this configuration profile. Dave, it was amazing. So all of a sudden, in system preferences, a selection appeared called profiles. It just magically. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's never there before. Yeah, yeah. That'll appear once once there is a profile that that that's pretty normal. That's right. Oh, that's pretty. I've never man. seen that before, though. Cool. And and I did the same thing. So at the very highest level, you can do things like lock the device, wipe the device, and a couple other things. And then if you if you dig into the if you dig into the guts of of the the, the whole uh, system, and then they let you link to an Apple School Manager program, device enrollment program, volume purchase program. It's um, I just scratched the surface, but cool. I, I just got to say I was tickled that I was able to disable. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. An app That's on my iPhone, and it just kind of pushed it down because it's a local network. Now, you probably have to do something a little different if you want this on an enterprise scale. I'm just doing it on my local server. So I'm, I'm sure once I'm outside of my, you know, home environment, I, I don't think this will work. Um, because when I go to the server, well, when I go to the server, no, well, the thing that, is right now, the server... I think I'd have to do additional work, though, I'd, or at least at the very least, I'd have to do VPN because right now the server is called MacBook Pro dot local. So, oh, huh? I thought the pushes, so I deployed it on I my local the network pushes went through Apple stuff, though. Well, I mean, you could try it by uh, turning yeah. off Wi-Fi on your phone and trying to push a change mm. to it. Yeah, I, I'm pretty world. sure it uses right Apple's push service, man. I, I, I think well, this would it work did remotely. Generate, well, it did generate a push service certificate, so yeah. that may in fact work no, if I'm no, outside I'm, of my I'm uh, pretty sure network. that's how all the MDM stuff works, is it, it goes via Apple's you know, APN push server or whatever that is. Yeah. So, Thomas, thank you. We, we, uh, I was misinformed. Uh, yeah, same. That. There's yeah. a full implementation there that... Um, I encourage people to check it out, especially from people that have given us questions like, how do I restrict the actions of my kids or my this or my that, uh, yeah. uh, what they do on their device? And this is certainly a way to do that. Yep. Cool. Make it some pushback, right? <laughs> well, you know, hey, buy their own stuff. Uh, Patrick from show 695 chimed in and we were having a discussion. Actually, we had several people. It wasn't just Patrick. Uh Chimed in, we we casually, offhandedly even mentioned that uh, Transmit, the FTP app, uh, was going away. And we talked about some alternatives and we got actually quite a few of you that chimed in and said, well, wait, 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 wait. Uh, what are you talking about? Transmit for Mac is still there. Like I can download it. Everything's cool. Uh, what do you mean? I rely on this. I'm with you. I rely on it, too. What I meant. Uh, but we weren't clear about was that transmit for iOS went away on February 1st of this year. And it went away solely because there was not enough interest to keep, uh, to keep it, it up to date. They didn't want to let it linger or die on the vine. So they have simply taken it down. If such a time comes when panic feels like there's money to be made it transmit for iOS, then, you know, by all means, uh, I think they would head back down that path, but transmit for transmit for Mac OS still good. Uh, all plans are to continue developing that as far as panic has told us. So everything's okay. Didn't mean to panic you. No pun intended. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. You know, I have one last thing and I, I, I this is just cause I got things out of order be, uh, because I, uh, I blame the flexor. Um, Rob also chimed in after our discussion about vector graphics and he suggests a piece of software for both the Mac and iPad called graphic. It's for, it's from Indio Inc. I N D E E O. And we will put a link to that, of course, in the show notes. So thanks, Rob. I really appreciate you chiming in with that because I think that's hopefully that gives us all the options that anybody ever needs to figure out. And I think Jeff Gamet's actually putting together a roundup piece on all of these. I've been feeding all of these to him as you've been sending them in. So, uh, so you're participating in two ways and I like that. John, I want to take a, uh, a moment here and thank our premium subscribers for this week. Uh, you can find out all about premium at MacGeekGab.com slash premium. Patrick M uh, sent in a one-time donation this week of a hundred bucks. Thank you so much, Patrick. You rock. Uh, on the $10 monthly plan we have from this week, Abdullah B, Frank A, Paul M, Mark R, Barry F, Neil L, Scott F, John G, James C, Joe S, and Ari L. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. And uh, on the biannual plan, 25 bucks uh, every six months that came in this week, Gary W, Louis Michel, Josh O, Paolo B, Margaret M, David G, and Daniel P., Thanks to all of you. Really, it, it, you know, I say it every week. We can't do this show without you. And it's true. Uh, so thanks so much for all your support, your questions, everything, all that good stuff. John, we're almost out of time. And in fact, I've, if I was smart, I would say we should wrap up here so I can get up and stretch. But, but. Is, there, is there anything you want to go through? 
No. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was, I feel like there was one other thing, but, uh, but you know, I just don't know if, uh, if it's going to come to mind. So no, I'm going to take some more Flexerol. I, I really don't like this stuff. It I makes looked it up here. Foggy, man. It's got some nasty uh, side effects here. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, it's not. You know. So anyway, uh, that's what I got. You can contact us though uh, if you're a premium listener. Uh, premium at macgeekup.com is the way to find us. If you are a uh, regular listener, and trust me when I say. We value your contributions, your questions. We value the fact that you are listeners, all of that stuff, like big time. You can send to us at feedback at com. And if you didn't hear that right, because Dave's on drugs, um, <laughs> <laughs> he said feedback at com. I'm pretty sure I said feedback at com the first time, despite any other factors that might influence things. Uh, You can call us, 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is? 4335. As far as you know. Where else can they find us, John? Just for kicks. Why not? There's still this Twitter thing that's floating around out there. You can tweet. You can consume tweets. I still don't get it, but um, on Twitter, I am John F. Ron. He is Dave Hamilton. That other guy is Pilot Pete. The podcast is Mac Geekab, and the publication is Mac Observer, all at twitter.com slash. There you go. Thanks so much uh, to Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth. Of course, our sponsors, Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com, Barebones Software at barebones.com, RoboForm at roboform.com slash M-G-G. I think we made it, John. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm so happy about the fact that we didn't do the thing that we warn people against that I want to hear it sung in multi-part harmony. Oh.